Thank you, Krisha, for the nice introduction. Hello, John, Frank, and Professor Barry Dixon. How are you today? So uh, my name is Dita, I'm your moderator today. So in these sessions, uh, we will have uh, three well-known uh, speakers uh, with a very, very interesting topics. So uh, for the start, I would like to introduce the first speaker is Professor John Marini. Um, he's, he's, he's famous, yeah, everybody who knows John Marini. He's from St. Paul, Minnesota, and he's a famous expert in critical care, especially in respiratory care and mechanical ventilators. Uh, he has received many awards and honor for many of his achievements. And his lecture today is uh, the unique ventilation features of COVID IRDS. So John, uh, we would like to invite you uh, to start uh, the presentations, please. Okay, thank you very much, Dita. Um, let me see if I can get, get this going here. Okay. Um, I, I believe that uh, the, the problem of COVID-19 ARDS is quite different um, from a ventilation standpoint, shares some features with conventional ARDS, but also has unique ventilation features. And that's what I'd like to share with you um, this morning there. Hmm. For some reason, it's not advancing. Um, okay, I have no uh, financial uh, relationships or conflicts of interest related to this uh, presentation. Now, uh, it's been a, a point of contention as the, the problem of COVID has developed, uh, whether or not we should change our approach to ventilating ARDS. And many prominent people have said, yes, we should. And uh, many prominent people have said, no, we should not. It's just like all the other forms of ARDS. And I'll try to prove to you that uh, the folks who say it is a little different should be listened to. If you want to say no differences, uh, I have to ask you, really? Uh, this was a nice editorial, but I think I disagree with it uh, in the Blue Journal in uh, the end of uh, November 2020. Uh, the statement is that for COVID-19, as with ARDS of other etiologies, it is, as the song says, the same as it ever was. And uh, I think if you follow that advice, you're like these lemmings who are jumping off a cliff. Uh, you can think it's okay in the, uh, as, as far as it had gone at that point. But then I think as time has evolved, we found that it is quite different. You can talk about ARDS uh, in terms of the Berlin definition. And certainly CARDS satisfies that definition. But although the, what I'll call the CARDS bird uh, qualifies as Berlin defined ARDS, it's a very strange example, just as these birds are very strange examples of conventional. We all know that coronavirus strongly affects the vascular side, and that produces features that are not typical for conventional ARDS. This was known from the very beginning, and yet people have decided to put this aside and not really pay attention to that fact. Luciano Gattinoni, a very close friend and, and colleague, uh, said at uh, the early stage that they found two types of COVID-19 ARDS. One was earlier, uh, it was milder, it had uh, peripheral infiltrates, which had a ground glass appearance, uh, but it didn't look typical for conventional ARDS. It later moved into a, a more severe form and with very different properties for PaO2 to FiO2 ratio and its relationship to uh, structure and to uh, co uh, compliance. Initially, the lungs in what he called L-type uh, ARDS were gas-filled and relatively compliant, even though the hypoxemia was almost as severe as it would eventually become. Eventually, 
there would be a PaO2 to FiO2 ratio that was uh, typical for very severe ARDS in those patients who did not recover. And they would have low or very low compliance. And we'll talk about that in a moment and the implications for treating them. Now, a number of very smart uh, and um, vocal people stepped up and, and tried to tried to say that uh, really COVID-19 was no different uh, in various ways, either at timing of intubation or that uh, there, there were no novel phenotypes in, in, uh, in uh, COVID respiratory failure. And uh, to each of these, people I respect very much, but we disagree. Why is there a disagreement regarding compliance? As I've already suggested, the time factor. Earlier, COVID lungs are relatively compliant, but they oxygenate poorly because of the vascular involvement. Higher PEEP levels geared to oxygenation will tend to overdistend these in individuals and if you measure their compliance, not taking into account what PEEP you're using, you will find that the, the patients have, quote, low compliance. In actual fact, their lungs are quite flexible at that earliest stage. Later, there is fibrotic contraction leading to low or very low compliance. Impaired mechanics at, in that state eventually uh, catch up to the severely impaired oxygenation. And we'll talk more about that in a moment. There were other controversies. Is a patient self-inflicted lung injury relevant to CARDS and should we delay intubation? Um, actually, in many, in many cases, we are uh, delaying intubation, I think, far too long uh, and, and allowing P. silly to emerge. This, I think, was an important uh, paper. David Cumello from, from Milan uh, published this. Uh, Gattinoni was the senior author here. Uh, basically, what it's what is showing you that CARDS in the middle does not have an obvious relationship of venous admixture and hypoxemia to the amount of non-aerated tissue in the lung. In other words, non-aerated tissue is the consolidated or atelectatic tissue. That is totally opposed to uh, those patients who are matched with routine ARDS based on the P to F ratio or based on compliance, they do have a relationship between non-aerated tissue fraction and venous admixture or uh, inversely oxygenation. So here we see the disconnect between gas exchange and mechanics. There's an uncoupling of PaO2 from severity and compliance. And it depends when you look at them. I'll point out here that if you follow PaCO2 kinetics, it more closely tracks ARDS severity. PaCO2 rises as the lungs contract and you enter the later stages. And we'll talk about that in a moment. Now, what does this imply about what we use in the, at the ventilator setting? Uh, well, let's talk about positive end expiratory pressure. And we are quite aware that uh, positive end expiratory pressure has several different possibilities for the lung that's infiltrated, acutely infiltrated, such as ARDS. What we hope for is that PEEP will cause stable recruitment without over distension. But in many cases where there is not a lot of recruitable tissue to open, you will have over distension, increased dead space, and redirected blood flow. The point here is that uh, COVID-19 acts more like the bottom lung here than the top lung. Initially, there may be some recruitable tissue, but it's overwhelmed by the amount of over distended tissue. And this means that PEEP must be downregulated. I'll come back to that as we go on. Late CARDS also may respond adversely to PEEP because there is no re recruitable tissue. PEEP redirects blood flow in that setting. PEEP increases dead space, increases over distension. There is a real tendency for villi to develop, and certainly barotrauma has been noted 
as a, an unusually frequent complication of standard treatment of patients with COVID-19. Now, <laughs> I, again, respect these people extremely, uh, but in an abundance of caution, they said from the beginning in very influential papers, which I think were actually not very helpful clinically, that respiratory system mechanics of patients with ARDS with or without COVID-19 are broadly similar. Oh, okay, depends what you mean. Um, we strongly recommend adherence to evidence-based management. Now, what do you mean by evidence? The evidence that they, they presented, and I don't wanna go through this in detail, had many things that were not proven by randomized clinical trials. And it's notable that they suggest, well, maybe you could liberalize tidal volume up to eight ml per kilogram of predicted body weight, for example. And, and PEEP might be harmful in patients with low recruitability. These are important things to point out, but it, the general thought was that ARDS and CARDS were similar and treat them the same way. I have to ask you, if that's true, do these tables, the, 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 the uh, ARDS ladder for uh, oxygenation and PEEP, do these apply for COVID-19 ARDS? Notice that even the lower PEEP, higher FiO2 table uh, encourages PEEP values from 14 all the way up to 24 centimeters of water. I think this is not really uh, in, not really a wise thing to do for reasons we've already covered in, in part. Now, Dan Brody and Phil Dellinger and I talked about the time course of uh, COVID-19 ARDS and how it went from better compliance and ineffective recruitment, atypical PEEP responses and gas-filled lungs to worse lung compliance, usual PEEP and prone responses in the middle part anyway, at the end, not so much, extensive shunting, edematous lungs, consolidated infiltrates. And uh, this gave rise, this time dependence gave rise to many of the uh, conflicts that were uh, raging in the literature throughout 2020 and 2021. This uh, from Martin Tobin, uh, P. Silly is not a justification for intubation of COVID-19 patients. Uh, Martin, I really disagree with you. I think that those people who are vigorously breathing should be intubated at an earlier rather than a later, later stage. Once you've exhausted the easy things to do and the patient is still vigorously breathing and struggling, that is a, that is a concern. I think you and I uh, probably know by this time that power has become a focus of ventilator-induced lung injury. Um, when you look at a small compartment, aerated compartment of the baby lung, the power that's applied to that baby lung to achieve the ventilatory uh, task is concentrated as that lung further injures. And power is one of those injuring agents that will will cause the, the lung eventually to uh, incur a ventilator-induced lung injury or P. Silly, and contract even further the size of the baby lung so that very small baby lungs have concentrated power and are more susceptible, in fact, to uh, uh, villi. That's particularly true in the setting of COVID-19 ARDS. And I think we've covered this uh, enough that uh, it should be fairly clear that both from the vascular side and from the airspace side, there is a tendency for a vortex to form where it, the power concentrates, further uh, injury occurs, and um, the patient eventually will need emergent uh, uh, intubation. There are things we have learned about how to non-invasively treat these patients that have been helpful, such as awake prone positioning, or, uh, or uh, high flow nasal cannula support. Uh, but still we have to be hyper alert in this setting uh, to uh, avoid uh, unnecessary exposure to high inflation pr pressures during spontaneous breathing. The reasons not to allow strong spontaneous breathing efforts to persist are 
It improves uh, oxygenation to intubate these patients. It reduces the oxygen demand in FiO2, which is a cofactor for, for uh, inflammation. It reduces villi risk for, the, for that reason uh, uh, and the, the stresses that are put on it mechanically. Uh, some have suggested that ventilator-induced diaphragmatic dysfunction is avoided by controlling ventilation and it avoids the patient's uh, neuromuscular fatigue, which may uh, precipitate an emergent need for intubation. Over time, the risks of vigorous efforts increase. And we have to understand that. Uh, we have to look at the trend. How is the patient doing? If they're not improving, we need to int intubate them earlier. Now, some have argued that uh, COVID-19 ARDS is not a, a, a different from conventional ARDS in terms of its behaviors mechanically. But I propose to say that unfamiliar mechanics occur in some late stage and severe CARDS. If you push on the belly, the, the blue uh, um, arrow here, and contract the space uh, for ventilation, or if you weight or load the, the sternum, for example, you have some very unusual behaviors. We reported this, I think we were the first group to do this, although there were several that, that came in just, just uh, in corroboration a little bit later, is that paradoxically improved respiratory compliance occurs with abdominal compression in AR, COVID-19 ARDS patients. Uh, there was another paper almost the same time from Carto and, 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 uh, and colleagues. This was one single case report. This was seven patients that we had collected over the preceding year. Potential protective effects of continuous anterior chest compression, which they did uh, by pressing on the sternum. We did ours by pressing on the belly. So the point is that by contracting the volume, you improve the compliance, which seems totally counterintuitive. Uh, uh, counter, uh, and if you increase PEEP, you worsen the compliance and increase the driving pressures that you need to deliver a given tidal volume. That's quite unusual for standard ARDS, although very, very severe ARDS rarely can do that. This is the uh, thing that you're, you're likely to look to see. In the clinical setting, you may see for volume controlled ventilation, this kind of pattern. And in many cases, the plateau pressures far exceed what we like to see as the lung protective. If you then weight the uh, the, the chest continuously or push continuously on the, on the belly, you find that the, uh, the inflation curve straightens out that your plateau pressure drops. And in this case, this is a real case, uh, schematized, but this is a real case we had, um, from uh, a very high level to a more permissible level. Uh, and if you take away your hand or you take away the weight, you recover almost instantly to the same uh, parameters. Now, this is how we explain it. And this is important to, to spend just a, a minute looking at. Um, the chest wall has a compliance curve in blue here that I'm outlining that's quite different from the lungs uh, 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 normal behavior. The norm uh, for the lung is this, and the chest wall, this. When we load the chest, we decrease the volume for any given, given pressure. And we indeed take the, uh, the lung to a different position on its own curve. This is a uh, CARDS lung. Um, and we go from a rather flat volume to pressure profile, meaning low compliance, to a better compliance. What, uh, what I think is important to, to note here is that the total lung volume is actually decreasing, but it doesn't make much difference because there's not a lot of recruitable tissue and a gas exchange actually may even improve with the loading. Now, I'm not saying that we, we've uh, uh, got nothing to worry about. We need to follow what we're doing, 
But in work that we've continued to do and um, are just finishing up now, we find that um, the loading really helps compliance. It does not deteriorate gas exchange and it actually may improve uh, hemodynamics. This is a very recent, uh, well, relatively recent paper, also of seven patients uh, ta talking about the prone position and pushing, it doesn't really matter whether it's the low back or the upper, upper uh, chest, although the low back seems to be more, uh, uh, um, more, more intense in its effect, uh, more effective in its effect, uh, but it, directionally, they're both the same. As you push down, you actually improve the uh, respiratory compliance and driving pressure in prone patients. This seems to most clinicians to be uh, counterintuitive. These are the pa patients from, uh, from that study. Uh, PEEP worsens and dorsal pressure improves driving pressure. In fact, we did some patients with abdominal binding and found a considerable improvement for many hours, in fact, days, uh, using uh, the abdominal binder, releasing it periodically only to uh, give the skin time to uh, reperfuse and, and uh, to avoid any kind of skin contact problems. But this might be a therapeutic possibility for the future, although we have not prospectively, uh, except in those seven cases, uh, and four of which uh, had an abdominal binder, uh, uh, we have not prospectively in, in conducted a big study yet. So it, there are questions. Uh, if you're trying to improve lung compliance by external compression, there are questions, a list of them uh, I covered along with Luciano in uh, our paper in critical care uh, last year. One of the interesting features of our uh, our observations uh, in, in uh, initially and uh, subsequently, and this is just completing now, uh, we found that when you put the patient flat, they may do better than when you lift them upright. And why is that the case? These are intubated passive patients. And what you expect is that the functional residual capacity total lung volume, remember total lung volume different from the lung volume that determines uh, the excursion, the tidal, tidal excursion and driving pressure, that increases as you go from flat to 30 degrees. You go from the horizontal position uh, to, from a, uh, a, a not loaded position to a loaded position because when you sit upright, you are pulling on the lung with a transpulmonary pressure, expanding the lung volume, putting the patient at the flatter part of his pressure volume relationship. This is the same principle as we talked about before with compression or with uh, re reduction of PEEP. Keeping PEEP the same, keeping everything the same, John Seligman from our group has, has completed a study of more than 20 patients now uh, looking at both supine and prone and finding that actually what we assume is the best for the patient may not be the best for the patient when they're in the, the severe stage of uh, COVID-19 ARDS. We, you go from a loaded position to a non-loaded position and you get into trouble. So for CARDS, time changes almost everything. I think we talked about that from the beginning. And I'd like to emphasize that CARDS uncouples PaO2 from compliance and severity. And I reiterate that following CO2 exchange may be a better indicator of severity. PaCO2 over weeks uh, of uh, ventilation in these patients, by the way, COVID patients tend to be on ve ventilators longer than standard ARDS um, of similar initial severity. Recruitability, increases at, at, at first and then decreases uh, to being nearly negligible at the, at the end. And compliance of, of the lung and the respiratory system declines. PaCO2 increases. So PaCO2 is a, uh, uh, a surrogate in a, in a sense 
for uh, what's happening to compliance, and that's a surrogate for the severity of the underlying uh, disease. So our takeaway points for ventilating COVID-19, prevent vigorous breathing and high transpulmonary pressures. Reduce the ventilatory demands, try to avoid intubation, but intervene early if efforts remain vigorous and the patient is dyspneic. Avoid high PEEP in the early phase and in the very late phase, uh, as we, we talked about in the, uh, the compression uh, slides that I got covered earlier. Prone positioning is a better option, but it's inconsistently effective in patients with COVID-19 ARDS. Consider a more horizontal position when the, peep pla when the plateau pressure is high. In other words, if the plateau pressure is perfectly acceptable to you, then a more horizontal position isn't necessarily a good thing. But if it's high, then uh, it, it, it does risk uh, higher pressures, driving pressures, plateau pressures, not to have the patient in a more horizontal position. Monitor mechanics and ventilation efficiency in your, your, your patients, the ventilation efficiency being PaCO2. Uh, usual tidal volume and PEEP tables may be misleading in the early phase. Personalized ventilation, follow plateau, minute ventilation, PaCO2. And above all, prepare for a marathon, not a sprint, since this is the Olympics uh, these days. Uh, and this is the Winter Olympics, but uh, let's, let's keep the theme going. Prepare for the marathon, not a sprint. Avoid sudden changes of large magnitude. Wean carefully. Have a low threshold for anticoagulation. And earlier tracheostomy may be necessary if your ICUs continue to be overwhelmed. So should we change our approach? I would say, yes, CARDS is not your standard ARDS. But no, if you tell me that you guide decisions by bedside physiology, which is definitely different for COVID-19 than standard ARDS. I've written about this a long time ago. I don't think that many of the principles have changed much. We've added a little, um, but I don't think there's a lot of contraindication in that or original paper. So with that, I'd like to uh, th thank you very, very much, and especially my friend, um, Cecile Chandra, for inviting me to participate this, this morning. Okay, thank you, John, for a very, very interesting uh, lecture. So we have a lot of takeaway points here about the prevent vigorous breathing and um, improve the mechanic and ventilation efficiency. So we will have a question and answer uh, session after all the three speakers has given uh, the lectures. So for the next uh, topics, uh, we move to the second uh, lecturer is Professor Barry Dixon. Hello, how are you? Good, thanks. Yeah, Prof yeah Professor Barry Dixon is an intensivist consultant at St. Vincent Hospital from Melbourne. Uh, his major areas is about RDS and earn a lot of uh, study and the reason is about uh, nebulized heparin to prevent RDS this year. Yeah. So his lecture today is the antiviral properties of heparin and its potential role in prevention and treatment of COVID. So we would like to invite Professor Barry Dixon to start the presentation. Thank you so much. And I'm hoping you can see my presentation. Yes. Right. And thanks uh, very much for the organizing committee and Susulu for inviting me. I'm really um, grateful. Thank you. Um, so yes, we've um, uh, obviously in Melbourne have had our um, uh, epidemic as well, and we came to um, the COVID issue with a background working with heparin already in other forms of acute lung injury. So um, when COVID came along, um, there's certain aspects of heparin that made heparin an attractive um, treatment, but perhaps also prevention for COVID, which essentially is what this talk is about. Um, and the things I'll address in this talk are the potential for using heparin prophylactically as a nasal spray um, to prevent getting COVID. I'll also talk about some studies we're doing at the moment and some studies we've done in the past using inhaled heparin to um, prevent acute lung injury, um, but also to treat COVID pneumonia. Um, and that last point is pretty much more or less what I just said. So I might just talk a little bit 
um, about some history, some recent history and some ancient history with regard to heparin, a bit dull, but we'll go there to start with. Um, and heparin as a therapeutic agent has actually been around for quite a while and has certainly stood the test of time. And I, I suspect we're using it more now than ever during COVID. Um, it was discovered at John Hopkins in the US. Um, it got its name because it was extracted from dog's livers and the other name you know, for livers is hep hepatocytes or hepatic vein. I suspect it's got some Greek or Latin derivative, but that's why it's called heparin because it was discovered from dog's livers. But then it sort of just sat there, I guess, on the bench for another 20 years or so until it was purified by uh, a fellow called Best in Toronto, who also purified insulin for the first time. So he was quite a significant character in medical history. Uh, it started getting used a few years after it was purified. So it's been in clinical use for 84 years. And it certainly was absolutely crucial for the development of cardiac surgery back in the 50s. Um, the use of heparin as an anticoagulant really allowed cardiopulmonary bypass to, to be developed. Um, so it's had a crucial um, role in many of the advances in medicine. Uh, so in 2000, it was estimated 12 million patients were administered heparin annually in the US, and I suspect that was mainly to prevent DVT. So it's got a very interesting recent history, heparin, and we use it a lot, obviously, in our, I imagine we all use it in our clinical practice. So just again, some interesting background to heparin. Where does it come from? Well, you could, you could uh, fractionate it from any animal species, including ourselves. We, every animal species produces heparin and has heparin uh, throughout its organs. So heparin is universally produced in all animal species. We happen to use pigs predominantly to to, to, to get clinical heparin. And I guess that's because there's a lot of pigs that are farmed for other reasons. And their intestines are quite high in heparin. And that's where most of the heparin is, um, is, is um, got for most of the world. But as I said, you could use anything to, to, as a source. And that's just a factory. And most of our heparin comes from China. Um, the vast majority is from China. Um, and that's just the process of fractionating the heparin from the pig guts there. And then it's fractionated further. And then it's sent to us, um, in our case, in these little ampules. Um, so that was the recent history of heparin. Heparin's got a much more um, ancient history. Um, and long before we existed as animals, um, 500 million years ago, heparin existed in sort of other species. Some of these species are still around now, such as the hydra. I don't really know what the hydra really is actually, but it is a very primitive animal species, but it expresses heparin on its cells, which is a bit surprising as it doesn't have a circulation. Uh, so it really isn't playing a role in anticoagulation. It's got some other role, which I'll, I'm gonna to touch on now because this other role speaks to some of the way um, pathogens in our environment uh, infect us and bind to us. And, um, and that probably reflects the fact that heparin has been on various cell membranes for, for you know, 500 million years. So pathogens have got to know it and, and got to use it. Um, so heparin is mainly found on cell membranes. Um, it's got some other very unique characteristics of heparin. It's got the most, it's probably the most promiscuous receptor there is of any molecule. Um, it binds over 400 separate um, ligands, which is very unusual. And it plays a very key role uh, in cellular communication. And I, I may have meant, forgot to mention, it's the most negatively charged of any biological molecule that we know of. And that very high negative charge means it's, it's able to make very rapid um, binding to other molecules. It's very avid in binding very quick, which is also a unique aspect of heparin. But as we know, other than cellular communication, it's got some other important roles in anticoagulation, fibrinolysis, tissue repair, inflammation, infection. It's a very important molecule in many aspects um, of our, of our um, homeostasis, but I'll keep going on a bit. Try to move this forward. Yep. So, you know, there's lots of these lists that go on and on and on and on about what heparin binds with and what it does. But obviously these 
top few are the ones we sort of know about in our clinical practice. We know it has anticoagulant uh, actions, uh, binds to factors two, nine, and 10, antithrombin. We're very familiar with that. But it has a whole lot of other um, uh, roles which uh, become a little less clear to us, um, but certainly is heavily involved in inflammation. It binds to platelet growth factor uh, F, um, it binds to a lot of interleukins. It, soaks up elastase, it binds to these white cell receptors, so it binds white cells um, and a whole lot of other things. It certainly plays a role in tissue repair, both in terms of tissue growth and putting down new blood vessels and a whole lot of other stuff that you just can't fit on one slide. So I'm just gonna briefly spend a little bit of time talking about the two forms of heparin we have in our body and in all animal species. So, um, those pig guts that they were getting the heparin from, they're actually getting the heparin from the pig guts because um, pig gut has got a lot of heparin in mast cells. Um, so, so do we. We have a lot of mast cells that have a lot of heparin granules in them. And these mast cells happen just to be predominantly in our liver, our gut, and our respiratory tract, which are interesting organs for mast cells to be in and for heparin to be in, which I'll come to in a tick. It's sort of it's the organs that seem to be exposed to our external environment. And it seems to be the organs that are therefore, so if you like, a barrier between our internal environment and the external environment. That's where the mast cells are. Most heparin though isn't in mast cells. In us, most mast cell, most heparin is attached to our cell membranes and our connective tissues. And that's called, that's a, a version of heparin called heparin sulfate, but that's the most, by far the most common form of heparin in us, which I'll come to in a tick. I can move forward if I can. So heparin sulfate, this is the one that's attached to, as you see here, the cell membrane. Uh, it's the most common form of heparin. It's a very odd looking molecule. It's a very, uh, looks like a tree. It's a very bizarre molecule. So it's got this um, core protein and it's got these really long glycosaminoglycane chains, you know, that go on and on for hundreds and hundreds of disaccharide layers in all directions and it's got branches everywhere. And you can sort of imagine it's just sort of floating about on the cell membrane, like a mop. It's my image of a mop there and it's mopping up things. And what it's mopping up pretty much is any other chemicals, molecules floating around. And its role really is to mop them up and to get those other molecules, um, um, that are floating around in the, um, in the interstitial space and getting to bind to receptors. If you like, it's an intermediary between mopping up those uh, signaling molecules and getting them onto a receptor here. That's its role. So as I said, I'll just go through this again. It's got these multiple long polysaccharide chains off the core protein. It's got this massive exponential number of binding sites per cell greater than any other um, uh, cell binding sites there is, you know, by factors of 10. As I've already said, it's got the highest negative charge of any biological molecule, which means it really is very um, attractive to other molecules and um, it, it causes fast binding interactions. And as you see, these sort of, these sort of branches are quite flexible, which also promotes um, binding of um, other molecules um, in the interstitial space. So that's great. This is a great way to, for, for, for molecules to interact with cells and to signal between themselves and to communicate. But if pathogens were able to bind to uh, heparin, that's the problem because if pathogens could bind to heparin as well, I mean, this is the most common cell receptor there is, then we're in trouble because those pathogens then have a way uh, to bind to the cell and potentially infect the cell. And they work that out, it would appear, many thousands of years ago. This is just a few of the pathogens that are able to bind uh, to heparin sulfate. And you know, they're all familiar to you, they're all pathogens. Um, pretty much any pathogen you can think of interacts with us uh, pretty much by heparin sulfate, um, including uh, coronavirus, all, all the coronaviruses and you know, SARS is no different. So they all, or COVID-2 is no different, it, it also, binds to ourselves that way and infects us that way. So this is just a little cartoon showing pretty much what I've just said. And in, 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 this, could be, this could be influenza or could be strep pneumonia. Uh, the principle is the same. It just happens to be uh, SARS, COVID-2 in this case. And basically you've got the core protein here, the heparin sulfate, you've got these big branching chains and 
it binds to the spike protein and the spike protein binds. And then once it's bound, it sort of allows an interaction between the other cell receptors such as ACE2. And once the COVID or the strep or whatever it is binds to ACE2, that whole thing is endocytosed into the cell and that starts uh, an infection, which can end badly for all of us. So I'm just gonna jump away from that a tick and I'll come back to that um, issue, uh, but I'll just quickly talk about mast cells because <laughs> I think it's an interesting thing. So mast cells contain free heparin. It, uh, it's not connected to any of our cells. So why have we got this free heparin in our mast cells, lining our gut, lining our lungs, uh, lining our livers? Um, what's that all about? And this is just a hypothesis in my head as to why we have mast cells in those spots. And I suspect it's to do with trying to prevent pathogens doing what I just discussed, i.e. binding to our cells by the heparin sulfate. Um, so as you know, the mast cells are positioned along capillaries and post capillary venules in you know, the, the liver, gut and lung. And if you're getting some bugs around there, you're gonna get some inflammation and you're gonna get mast cells releasing their granules, including heparin. And obviously if you've got pathogens there and there's free heparin and the pathogens bind to the free heparin, they're out. They've just been switched off. They no longer can bind to our uh, heparin on the cells. So then in fact, it, it's like a decoy molecule that sort of just um, sucks them up and they, they're, they're out. So free heparin in mast cells may play a role, hypothetically may play a role in, in binding to pathogens to prevent them from binding to our cells. So there's been a lot of work obviously with COVID uh, and demonstrating where um, uh, the spike protein, this is a spike protein here um, on the COVID where it binds to heparin and these, these dark blue areas are the heparin binding sites. The spike protein is a very basic molecule which most pathogens have because that's how they bind to heparin which is a very negatively charged molecule. So most pathogens have uh, these very basic amino acid um, binding sites for heparin. And, you know, obviously there's an interest in heparin and COVID because of its antiviral properties. And this is just some early work showing uh, the concentration of heparin you need to stop it um, infecting what we call these viro cells. So you can sort of put um, the virus, the COVID virus on these mammalian viro cells in culture and see how quickly they infect the cells. Uh, it's just showing that there's a constant, as you increase the concentration of heparin in these cultures, that less virus is able to infect um, those cells. So it's certainly got a role in preventing viruses infecting mammalian cells. And now I'm going to jump again. Uh, now this is now just talking about some work we did with heparin prior to um, COVID. So this, this paper was published um, early in 2021. So this was a study of using inhaled heparin. We were using inhaled heparin in those days um, for very similar to reasons why you'd use it in COVID, but there's some other aspects of heparin that might be beneficial other than this antiviral and antipathogen as aspects we're gonna talk about in a moment that might be beneficial in people who are critically ill with acute lung injury. And so we did, we did this phase three trial of inhaled heparin to reduce um, the risk of developing, um, of, of another way, to improve your chances of accelerating your recovery from acute lung injury. Um, so this is a randomized double blind controlled trial. And oh, this is, some, this is someone else who did slide for me. So I'll just jump all that through. Um, anyway, um, why did we do it again? You know, heparin has all these very interesting, um, all these interesting actions. And I've touched on some of the anti-inflammatory actions. And if you've got acute lung injury, having something that's got some anti-inflammatory actions might be a good thing, might help you recover more quickly. It, it, it sort of inhibits white cell activation. It also reduces uh, endothelial permeability, which is a very um, common thing, you know, if you've got inflamed lungs. We know it's got anticoagulant properties, which I'll talk to a bit. It's got fibrolytic properties, and we've talked about the antibacterial and antiviral properties. So there's a whole lot of things that are happening in acute lung injury that would make heparin a potentially attractive thing to trial to see what it would, what it would or wouldn't do in terms of um, accelerating, accelerating your recovery. So we basically enrolled patients who were ventilated who had some form of acute lung injury. It could be mild, it could be severe. They were all in, it was a pretty heterogeneous group, I guess. Basically you had to have some impairment in your oxygenation. You had to have a PF ratio of less than 300. And you had to think 
the clinician had to think that this person wasn't going to get better overnight, i.e., you know, things are all going to be good and they're going to be extubated the next day. They had to have the clinician think they're going to be ventilated for at least a couple of days. So we're trying to capture a slightly higher risk group of patients. So we randomised 256 patients in nine hospitals in Australia, including uh, Frank's hospital. Frank was a, a co-investigator on this study. And we nebulised uh, heparin. And so I'm just talking about some of the other reasons why we wanted to do it. And this is actually a, um, a, a electromicrograph of a, a air sac. Uh, this is your alveolar membrane. And this is an inflamed air sac. It's got some strip um, in it. And when you get inflamed air sacs, you get leaky capillary beds, you get endothelial permeability, and you get your plasma leaking out. Your plasma leaks out of your capillary bed into the airspace. And once plasma leaks out in the airspace, it turns to fibrin. You get fibrin clots all through your air sacs. And fibrin in air sacs doesn't help gas exchange. Yeah, and then once you've got the fibrin there, that really sets up a mess because then white cells want to come and eat the fibrin and it just creates a lot more inflammation. Um, so heparin, um, we thought early on, you know, heparin's not a bad drug if you've got all this clotting in the air sacs and also clotting in your microvascular chart. So this is also an inflamed air sac. This is um, the air sac here. This is the other membrane. This is an inflamed lung and we're actually staining for fibrin and take my word for it, but these are the capillaries in the air sacs. And these capillaries are no longer having any blood flow in them. They've got clot in them. Uh, so having microvascular thrombi in your lungs is not a good thing. It does not help gas exchange either. Um, and as we know with COVID, that's a particularly prominent mechanism of injury. There's a lot of microvascular thrombosis, particularly in COVID and in larger vessels. So that was the other reason we thought um, heparin might be a good thing to try. So what did we do? We um, randomized them. They ne got nebulized heparin every six hours. They got 25,000 units um, every six hours while they ventilated. If they got extubated, we stopped. And if they remained ventilated, it was given up after 10 days. And we based that dose on some previous studies. And there you go. We used a, a, a nebulizer, an aerogen nebulizer, which we like, and it creates this lovely mist very fine particles, which means you can, the finer the particle, the more likely it will get down to the distal airway. Um, nebulizing is actually, um, not all nebulizers are the same, and nebulizing is important to have very small molecules being nebulized, you know, getting very small um, ones nebulized if you want to get them down to the air sacs. It's very easy to get nebulized drugs into the larger airways. It's much harder to get them down in the air sacs. So you do need to use a system that's going to create very small molecules that are more likely to get into the air sacs. And that's just the system we used. There it is there, nebulizing. And you do need to put a filter on the expiratory limb because heparin is very negatively charged, as I said. It's a long molecule. It sticks to everything, including it just sticks to everything. So if you don't do that, you'll get some, a very sticky mess on your expiratory valve, which will eventually seize. Um, so yeah, it's really important. What did we find? So in fact, our primary outcome was in fact, we were very, um, what were we? Heroic. Back in the day when we were submitting this uh, for ethics uh, and for fundraising, we thought we'd go with a, a very, very, very patient-centered outcome because there's all the rage in those days, patient-centered outcomes. And we thought a really patient-centered outcome would be what their physical function was like at day 60 after enrollment, i.e. could they dress themselves? Could they walk around the house? Um, you know, did they have a lot of disabilities or they didn't? So this is a very patient-centered outcome, but it was probably a pretty high bar to try and achieve in a 256 patient study. But anyway, that's what we went with. This is what's called a bioline plot and it's showing the heparin group and the placebo group and it's showing the outcomes and they look kind of similar. And when you look at the average outcomes across these two groups, they are quite similar. Um, a higher score is better, it means you've got less disability, more function. So, the, the, you know, your, your physical function score was better than the heparin group um, at day 60, but there was no p-value on that. However, if you do post hoc analysis, which we are keen to do, can't help ourselves, uh, and we look at what's happening here in this violin plot, there's a, an odd, they look a bit different. And the reason they look a bit different is in the placebo arm, there's this 
whole lot of patients with very, very poor physical function outcomes at day 60. And we sort of don't have that similar thing here. We have a bit more of a lump up here. And so we wanted to look to see, well, you know, what was going on there. So we did a post-hoc analysis. And if you're just looking at patients who develop very poor physical function uh, at day 60, just if you look at that subgroup, yeah, we definitely had less people getting very severe physical function uh, at day 60. So anyway, that's post hoc, maybe means something, maybe it doesn't. But it was a particularly heterogeneous group that we enrolled. And it does sort of suggest that if you're going to use uh, inhaled heparin to try to accelerate recovery, you probably want to choose a group at higher risk of a very poor functional outcome. Because obviously a lot of these patients have all had very good outcomes. Um, anyway, that's all speculation. What we did find, however, that if you were risk, if you, we, we enrolled patients who had ARDS at baseline and patients who didn't have ARDS at baseline. So this is just looking at the patients who are, who are at risk of getting ARDS. And what we found was that there was a significant reduction in patients at risk of getting ARDS uh, at day uh, 60, or day five, actually, this was assessed at day five. So we halved the chances of people developing ARDS. If you look at it another way, you look at the Murray Lung Injury Score, which is sort of a similar uh, scoring system to assess um, progression of lung injury. It's a bit more, I think it's a bit more nuanced. It gives you a bit more information. It's not used as much these days. Um, but again, it's, it showed us again that we could reduce progression of acute lung injury in that first five days. So in the heparin group, their scores actually got lower, while in the placebo group, they went up a bit. And on average, um, you know, there's a significant difference uh, in the rate of recovery, uh, and it was better in the heparin group. And if you look at the four components of the Murray Lung Injury Score, the predominant um, driver was in fact the X-ray changes. Uh, and when you look at the X-rays, you know you're looking at the um, quadrants, and you're looking how many quadrants have uh, infiltrate. Um, and we saw surprisingly, and the, the lower the score, the better the more you've improved. A lower score is, is, is better, means you've improved more. Red is heparin, blue is saline. And we saw some pretty dramatic differences in those, particularly those first two days, where if you got inhaled heparin, your pulmonary infiltrate definitely was clearly getting better quicker. And then over time it catches up. But we saw, we also saw improvements, but not to the same extent, you know, in oxygenation, red is, lower red is better than the blue. Uh, in terms of the amount of PEEP being used, um, less PEEP was being used in the heparin group and in compliance as well, we saw improvements. So not surprisingly, Frank and myself um, have been looking at using um, heparin in COVID for all the reasons we've discussed, it's got antiviral properties, it reduces inflammation, it seems to accelerate recovery of lung injury, it's available, it's cheap, blah, blah, blah. So we've started some studies in Australia and essentially it's the same study as I just said, but we're enrolling patients who've been, in my case, ventilated with COVID. And to date, we've enrolled 50 patients in two ICUs in Melbourne. And all I can say so far is there's been no serious adverse events, um, but that's an ongoing study. And then I'll just finish on this other study that's ongoing um, also in Australia. Uh, and this is prevention of uh, COVID. Um, so, Heparin, again, is quite an attractive option, you know, to think about preventing getting COVID because it's got antiviral properties. Um, it's safe. It's been used more than any other drug in the history of mankind. We produce heparin ourselves um, and it's available. Um, so, you know, the thought would be, can you just use it as a nasal spray uh, to reduce your risk of getting COVID? And why a nasal spray? Well, basically, um, you, your, your nose has got the ciliary epithelium and it actually is the major site of initial infection and replication and shedding of COVID. That's where it generally starts in most people. And viral shedding from the nose in the early phase of infection may represent a critical period for intervention to prevent transmission to others. So if you've got COVID and you're getting nasal heparin, it actually might reduce your risk of infecting someone else as well. Viral replication in nasal mucosa uh, may progress to lower risk for tract infection and systemic illness. So again, if you can kind of reduce that replication in the nose, Perhaps, and this is just speculation, you may reduce that person, individual's risk of going on to get a more severe pneumonia. Uh, and again, I've talked about limiting community spread and I've talked about why we think it could be useful. Um, so this is just an EM, electron microscope 
study of you know your nose and the ciliated ciliated nasal epithelium and you can see this is COVID actually <laughs> binding to it all so this is just what's happening in our nose when we get COVID. it's binding it's replicating it's infecting our cells there starts there and again i'm just going to go through this once more so basically if you've got some shove nasal heparin up your nose that morning and then you happen to come across someone with COVID, and you inhale the COVID molecule and you've got all this free heparin you know just sitting around your nasal mucosa well that heparin is going to bind the spike protein and once it's bound that heparin that particular virus particle is out it can't infect you anymore because it now can't bind to your um, nasal epithelium via the heparin it's expressing as well. So this is a, it's a decoy, you know, it, it stops this from getting to there. So a group in Melbourne have um, tried many times to get some funding for this study unsuccessfully and that till now. And so they've been trying to do a blind a placebo controlled randomized uh, study um, of households. So a household with someone in it who's got COVID, but everyone in the household either gets placebo or gets nasal spray. Uh, and basically they'll be getting 700 units twice up each nostril three times a day for 14 days. And the proposal is to, uh, to do 268 households, which is about a thousand people. And the primary outcome is whether people who didn't have COVID in their household gets COVID. There's a whole lot of secondary outcomes. Um, and after a lot and a lot of no's, they finally got some funding actually a few months ago from the Victorian government, they actually got $4 million. So this study has got a chance of getting done. Unfortunately, or fortunately, um, we don't have much COVID in Melbourne right now. So they might be looking for some partners, I don't know. But uh, unlike most COVID studies, they've actually got some money at the moment. So we'll see where that goes. Um, and I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Barry Dixon, uh, for your very interesting presentations. So we already have a lot of questions, but we'll leave it at the end of the all the lecture. So the next speaker is uh, Professor Van Haran. Uh, he's a full professor in Australian National University and adjunct professor at the University of Canberra. His main research interests include sepsis, RDS, and also COVID. Uh, so today's lecture is update on inhaled nebulized heparin for COVID-19. So we would like to invite Professor Van Haran to start the presentation. Thank you very much, Dita. Uh, thanks for the invitation to speak again at Inner Anesthesia. Um, and I think my presentation will be quite seamless um, to Barry Dixon's presentation. It's the same topic slightly different angle, a bit more clinical data, where are we at with the research looking at nebulized heparin as a treatment for COVID-19. Um, so I don't have any relevant disclosures for this presentation. Um, just going back to the initial timeline of COVID-19 and some of the uh, early discoveries, um, of course, we all remember that the first cases were identified in China, in Wuhan on the 26th of December, 2019. And then um, basically within sort of one or two weeks, um, the sequence of that virus, the genetic makeup of that virus was already submitted to the gene bank, which was very quick. And then within a month, it, it became clear that ACE2 is the important binding site of the virus to enter the cells as Barry Dixon has just shown you as well. So this was all very important information. Uh, and, um, and this is relevant for the heparin uh, as a potential treatment for, um, for COVID-19. Um, just to update it, WHO dashboard uh, yesterday afternoon. So 405 million confirmed cases around the world. Um, and these are confirmed cases, so obviously there will be far more cases in reality because uh, patients, people may have COVID without getting tested. Um, and of course, there is uh, now close to 6 million deaths uh, directly from COVID. Um, there's also a massive 
uh, death rate from just the fact that we have a pandemic and people don't get their normal healthcare um, and surgery done because hospitals are overwhelmed. So the real mortality rate, the real death rate of the COVID pandemic is much higher than just the deaths directly from the COVID-19. What I've also been very impressed with is the, the response of the scientific community in terms of um, doing research and finding out, you know, what's, what COVID is, how we can uh, measure it, how, how we can treat it. And last time I looked, there were already almost 170,000 articles on PubMed just on COVID-19. And of these articles, 1,100 were clinical trials and almost 600 were randomized controlled trials. So these are the published studies so far. And in the pipeline, there's a lot more. There's just on one of the clinical trials uh, regist registers, there's six and a half thousand st studies listed that have COVID-19 as their main topic. And almost 3000 studies are currently actively recruiting. So we're going to see a lot more data in the next months and year in terms of COVID-19 research. So that's very impressive. And of course it's very needed because this is a completely new problem that we're facing um, globally. Now just going back to the first large case series that came from China, from the Chinese CDC, um, 72,000 cases in early 2020. Um, and just describing what these patients had, um, and what, what's important of this uh, sort of initial case series, uh, and of course, these percentages have changed a little bit with the new variants of COVID-19, but the original variant, um, most patients had just mild symptoms or no symptoms at all. Uh, and only about 14, 15% of patients became quite sick, needing oxygen, uh, perhaps needing to be admitted to hospital. And only a small proportion, around 5% of these patients, um, became very sick, needing intensive care admission uh, and support with their breathing and sometimes with other organ dysfunction as well. And in this first case series, the case fatality rate was 2.3%. Um, what constantly surprises me in, in and I've just been working in the COVID in the COVID unit last week, so I saw, I saw many COVID patients again. What 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 never stops just sort of surprising me is how bad these chest X-rays look. So patients come to the emergency department, are hypoxic, but otherwise breathing okay, maybe a bit tachypneic, and you make this chest X-ray. And it is just shocking. The abnormalities, the widespread abnormalities on these chest X-rays is just really quite impressive. Um, and that's early on. And of course, that gets only worse later on, as we've also seen in the uh, presentation by uh, Professor Marini. So again, based on the early data, and some of these percentages have changed now, certainly with the Omicron uh, variant, but up to 25% of patients who come to hospital or who are admitted to hospital then continues on needing help with their breathing. Um, and if they do need help with their breathing, if they need to be intubated and ventilated, the mortality is still quite high. It's not as high as, as in this slide anymore, but it's still quite high. Um, as we've seen, and I'll get back to that in a second, um, there is an unusually high incidence of clots in the lungs, uh, both in the alveolar sacs and in the uh, in the blood vessels in the lungs. Um, and perhaps as, 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 as John Marini showed, there is an unusually high compliance. Um, although um, wh when we went back to, um, to the lung safe study that we did a number of years ago with uh, Giacomo uh, Bellani as the first author, um, we went back to the JAMA, uh, sorry, to the LungSafe study um, and database to find out whether this high compliance and early ARDS is really something new. Um, is it very unusual? So we went back to the LungSafe database and we published that um, recently in the Blue Journal. And we found um, about 1,100 patients that we had data on compliance in early ARDS. So that is on day one and two of ARDS. Uh, 
uh, ventilated patients in uh, ICUs. And what we found was that the phenotype H as described by Luciano Gattinoni with this low compliance, these very, very stiff lungs is as, as, yeah, as we know is the predominant um, sort of type of ARDS that we see uh, before COVID. In the majority of patients, 74% of patients have a low compliance of under 40. But in ARDS before COVID, there's also quite a significant proportion of patients who have a normal compliance or preserved lung mechanics. So they don't have that very low compliant with stiff lungs. And as John Marini showed, that's also obviously very dependent on time, but these were all patients on the first two days of their ARDS diagnosis. And so we found that one in four in the LungSafe database pre-COVID had a compliance over 40 and one in eight a compliance over 50. When we plotted the PF ratio, so the severity of hypoxia in these ARDS patients against compliance, there was not much of a relationship uh, between compliance and uh, PF ratio, as you can see here. Um, PF ratio gets worse on the X axis going to the left, but the compliance only marginally drops. And there's a huge, I think, variation in compliance over the different range of PF ratio. So what we, what we said in this paper is that a relatively high compliance and being at the same time deeply hypoxic is not is not necessarily new with COVID ARDS. We've seen it before, but I completely do agree with Don Marini that we are looking at a different at a different entity here. The pathophysiology of the COVID nineteen lung injury is quite different and quite specific, uh, and creates this this different type of ARDS. So. We'll, we'll go through the different steps, and you've heard uh, a lot of it already in, 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 in Barry Dixon's talk and in John Marini's talk. But first, of course, um, the virus needs to enter the cell, and um, it does this by um, being swept up, as Barry showed so nicely, by heparin sulfate, and then the virus binds to the ACE2 receptor. The spike proteins of the, of the virus bind to ACE2, and then it gets into the cell. This is already the first step of causing damage because sitting on that ACE2 receptor, hijacking that ACE2 receptor basically makes it impossible for that ACE2 receptor to do what it normally should do. And, and this then leads to vasoconstriction and lung, lung injury all, almost immediately just from binding and hijacking that, um, that, that ACE2 receptor. And of course these ACE2 receptors sit pretty much on the lining of your airways and, and air sacs, on the, both on the type one and type two alveolar cells. Then secondly, and we've already talked about this, but COVID-19 is different in a sense that it creates much more clotting problems than, than, uh, than we see in other ARDS types. So there's a significant coagulopathy, which leads um, to both clotting in the vasculature, small thrombi, but also actually pulmonary embolism. And the fibrin that goes into the air sacs creates this hyaline membrane that then um, makes it harder for people to breathe. So this coagulopathy is, an, coagulopathy is an important part of the pathophysiology. And you've, you've seen these images before in Barry's presentation um, in, a, in a model of strep pneumonia where the fibrin goes into the alveolar sex and then uh, creates uh, hyaline membranes that is um, an important part of ARDS. So the fact that there's much more thrombosis, much more coagulopathy in COVID pneumonia and COVID ARDS than in non-COVID ARDS has been shown in many, many different studies. This is just one of these studies uh, and it is, it's clear that COVID has much more clotting problems, much more thrombosis and much more PE than non-COVID. In fact, when I was on my COVID pod last week, uh, more than 50% of our patients were on therapeutic anticoagulation for proven uh, 
pulmonary embolism in the in um, in in COVID. Then another part of this damage that's caused uh, that that COVID causes to the lungs is the inflammation. So the activation of the macrophages um, that then release all sorts of uh, pro-inflammatory mediators um, that causes a sort of a local cytokine storm in the lungs uh, is very damaging. Now, this is mainly a local cytokine storm. And my good friend, Peter Pickers, from where I, where I was trained back in the, in the Netherlands, we, we used to train together, um, published his paper, a senior author, where he compared the cytokine levels in patients, so in the blood, systemic cytokine levels in patients um, with COVID-19 ARDS, and then compared this with sepsis and ARDS, sepsis with no ARDS, out of hospital cardiac arrest and trauma patients. And as you can see in panel A, panel A is TNF, so tumor necrosis factor. And the left, on the left-hand side, COVID-19 with ARDS, those levels are, if anything, lower than patients who have sepsis and ARDS. So there's less cytokine activation in the blood, in the systemic blood, in COVID-19 patients with ARDS than in sepsis patients. Similarly, when you look at the interleukin-6 concentrations or at the interleukin-8 concentrations. So it seems to be that a lot of this cytokine storm that's happening seems to be mainly uh, happening in the lung. And this is, of course, why our COVID-19 patients don't, don't usually present with septic shock. They don't have vasodilatory shock, needing vasopressors, very different from other types. Another important part, uh, and you've seen it also in, in one of the slides from John Marini, is the formation of so-called DNA nets, so neutrophil extracellular traps. It, this is basically the neutrophils um, uh, extracellular DNA, which is super toxic um, and which causes additional lung damage. So when you think about, um, and, and what I perhaps didn't mention so much is that um, specifically COVID-19 causes a lot of um, inflammation and abnormalities to the endothelium as well, not just the epithelium. So when you think about these different uh, parts of the pathophysiology, of course, you can target the different elements of the pathophysiology. You can target the virus in isolation, like we do with remdesivir, or you can target the cytokine storm, the inflammatory problem. And we're doing it with steroids, of course, uh, dexamethasone, um, some of these, the interleukin antagonists, uh, tocilizumab, for example, work as anti-inflammatory. You can target uh, the clotting problems with anticoagulants, and then there's different other ways. And I guess the benefit, and this is why we're um, so optimistic about the, the therapeutic potential of, of inhaled heparin, is that heparin has all these effects in one drug. It's antiviral, anti-inflammatory, and anticoagulant. So together with Barry and a whole uh, bunch of other people, uh, especially Clive Page, uh, Professor Clive Page uh, from King's College in London, who's my partner in crime with these global studies, um, we set out to uh, look at whether we could use, whether we could use nebulized heparin as a treatment for COVID-19. So we first um, su summarized the whole rationale in this paper in critical care in 2020. And basically, when, you when I take you to the, through the same steps, um, it'll show what heparin could potentially do. So obviously, back to where the virus enters the cell, and as Barry has already shown, when you have free unfractionated heparin that binds to these spike proteins, the heparin is no longer able to bind to the ACE2 receptor and no longer able to enter the cell. So it's not infectious anymore. This has been shown uh, by Julia Tree and, and Clive Page uh, group as one of the first groups from Public Health England. Uh, they looked at the concentration of heparin, unfractionated heparin that's required to stop the virus from entering cells. And that antiviral activity of un unfractionated heparin is much, much stronger 
then for example, low molecular weight heparin or clexane or delta parin, uh, those sorts of drugs. So it's quite specific to unfractionated heparin. And since then other groups have shown the same. Heparin of course, as an anticoagulant would, um, would inhibit the coagulation activation that is so overwhelming in the lungs in COVID-19. Heparin is very also shown in a table is an anti an anti-inflammatory drug. So it produces the release of these pro-inflammatory mediators. It's been shown in other studies to reduce the DNA nets, uh, mainly in COPD and cystic fibrosis studies where inhaled heparin is also used as treatment. And, and last but not least, I didn't talk about this before, but heparin is also a mucolytic. So it sort of dissolves some of the mucus uh, and about 25% of COVID-19 patients have quite significant um, sort of sticky mucus production. And this is also why inhaled heparin has been trialed uh, in studies in cystic fibrosis patients to get that mucus um, out. So that's sort of the theoretical background of how heparin might actually work in COVID-19. So what is the actual evidence that heparin does something in terms of preventing or treating lung injury. And this was again summarized in our paper. Uh, there's quite a number of preclinical studies or so animal studies, laboratory studies that have all sort of shown the same outcomes, which is it improves that, that, that coagulation problem in the lungs. This is all pre-COVID. Uh, it reduces the inflammation. So it does work as an anti-inflammatory drug uh, and, it, and it improves oxygenation in, in different models of acute lung injury. Then there's also a bunch of clinical studies. So in humans, most of these studies are quite small, but again, they all point in the same direction where the coagulation problem is improved. There's less dead space. The lung injury score that Barry showed before in his study, the Murray score is improved and patients get off the ventilator quicker in these smaller studies of acute lung injury before COVID. Barry has discussed this study in a, in a lot of detail already, so I'll go through it very, very quickly. Um, this is the largest study so far done with inhaled heparin in patients with ARDS or at risk of ARDS. This was pre-COVID, so not, not, no COVID patients. And as Barry has shown, there was an improvement in the lung injury score and less patients developed ARDS as, as some of the uh, important outcomes. So we started then our inhaled heparin in COVID-19 studies, and I'll explain a little bit about what these studies are. Um, but this is the first publication of actual inhaled heparin in COVID-19 patients. So we published this two weeks ago, um, 98 patients, uh, two hospitals in the US and one hospital in Argentina um, gave inhaled heparin to patients, um, not as part of a study, but as part of, uh, uh, you know, basically a trial of treatment in patients who were getting worse. Um, and we uh, looked at the, the data in a lot of detail to really find out what was going on. When we published a paper two weeks ago, there was a big media storm here in Australia, and in fact, also in some other countries that um, that honed in on the, um, you know, on the potential of this this treatment, which would, of course, if it works, which, which would be quite attractive because it's cheap, it's available all around the world, um, but of course, you know, we haven't we haven't proven yet that it works. Um, our case series was an uncontrolled case series in 98 patients. Um, and I'll show you quickly some of the results of that. Um, so average age 66, um, a number of these patients were already intubated. Uh, they received nebulized heparin using different devices. So it was all done in a different way. They used different doses in the different hospitals as well. And on average, they received that treatment for about six days. The main outcome of our case series was really safety. Um, the Lancet paper, Barry's Lancet paper already showed that inhaled heparin in patients who are ventilated with ARDS or at risk of ARDS is very safe. 
but it wasn't done yet in COVID patients. And these are patients, the majority of these patients are not ventilated. So it was important to show safety again. Um, the first thing we looked at was whether there was any spillover of the heparin that you inhale into the systemic circulation. And we did that by measuring APTT to see if, if you inhale heparin in the doses that we gave, uh, whether that would increase APTT. And as you can see in panel A, in patients where we had that data, uh, 60 patients, um, the baseline APTT before starting heparin compared to the highest level during the heparin treatment during the six days, um, the sort of peak level of, of APTT, as you can see, the peak level was slightly higher than the baseline level, but the peak level was still within the normal range. So it didn't actually prolong the APTT. It didn't actually cause extra anticoagulation in the body. So it doesn't really spill over in any sort of clinically significant way in the body. Uh, we also looked at uh, complications, bleeding, uh, most importantly, uh, there were two patients who, who developed a bleeding in this case series. And these, both these two patients were on therapeutic anticoagulation, on therapeutic clexane or therapeutic heparin, uh, and then they developed that bleeding. So we believe that uh, the inhaled heparin was very unlikely uh, contributed to that, to that bleeding. They were already on systemic anticoagulation. So um, the most important conclusion of our case series is that we believe that, this, that it is safe, but then to see if there was any effect on these patients when they received heparin, we looked at some of the oxygenation parameters. So this is the SF ratio, which is basically your pulse oximetry, your, your saturation over your FiO2, so how much oxygen people receive. Um, and the higher that number, the better, the lower, the worse. And as you can see, um, before we started heparin, which, ha which started on zero, so in the days before these patients received heparin, they all were trending worse and worse. They all were uh, showing a worsening of their SF ratio. This, is probably, this was probably the reason why these clinicians thought, let's trial nebulized heparin because nothing else was working and these patients were getting worse. Then at time zero, the inhaled heparin was started and you can see that after that oxygenation improved and you can see that the, the slope before and the slope after is significantly different. Now, this is not proof because there's no control group and maybe these patients would have improved anyway. Um, and maybe it's got nothing to do with the heparin we gave, but it is, we think it is promising. It, 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 it does give a signal that heparin may be uh, helping with improving oxygenation in these patients. And similarly, when you just look at the FiO2, so how much oxygen these patients received before the heparin started, the FiO2 was going up, 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 especially in the intubated patients and after they received the heparin, the heparin was started quite quickly. The FiO2 came down um, most significantly in the patients who were not on the ventilator, uh, but also in patients who were ventilated. So these are exploratory outcomes that show that maybe there is something happening. And we also looked at a couple of other outcomes such as the WHO modified ordinal scale that also improved in patients when patients received heparin. But I just want to stress once more, this is not a controlled study, not a, not a randomized study. It doesn't provide us with evidence that it works. It does provide us with pretty good safety data, like we already had from Barry's uh, pre-COVID study from The Lancet. Um, and it provides us good safety data in actual patients with COVID-19 ARDS in the hospital. So what are we doing at the moment? So Barry showed um, this study already, the charter study. So it's been done in Australia, but also in other countries. And we are combining these different individual studies um, to get uh, an outcome quicker than if we just use one of the studies in one country. Uh, and as Barry has shown, uh, 
um, we gave we give patients uh, who are intubated and ventilated um, 25,000 units of inhaled heparin every six hours. Uh, and we compared it to not giving this to patients. So the standard care group is compared to the standard care plus heparin group. There's no placebo in this study. The other study that we're doing, and we're actually progressing quite well with the study, we're now close to 500 patients in this study, um, is inhale hep. So this is, a re these, these are studies, individual studies in different countries that we're combining in a meta trial, so prospectively pooling the data until we have enough patients to, you know, to say there is an effect or there is not an effect of inhaled heparin. So these are patients who are um, not intubated, they are hospitalized, so they're in the hospital, they are on oxygen because of COVID-19 and they need, um, uh, so they need oxygen and they're then randomized into either getting nebulized heparin or just standard care. And we are looking at intubation as an endpoint. So we're hoping that with the inhaled heparin, we can keep patients off the ventilator. And there's a whole bunch of other things that we're looking at. Uh, and I'm extremely excited that um, Indonesia is, um, is, is uh, on board of inhale hep of this study. Um, and these are the hospitals and the investigators that have signed up to join this international initiative, this initial collaboration, because I think this is the way we're going to get an answer sooner rather than later. And also, you know, we need to get this answer from the real world. So not just some fancy American, sorry, John, no offense, but not just some fancy American study. We need studies in all sorts of countries around the world to see if this works, this inhaled head print in different healthcare societies as well. So I'm very excited that this team is, uh, has joined us. Um, so in summarizing my talk um, and, and perhaps Barry's talk, uh, we believe that there's a very strong biological rationale for nebulized heparin as a treatment for COVID-19. And we have to test this in randomized studies uh, because we know it works uh, you know, uh, it, it, as an antiviral by binding to the spike protein and preventing the virus from getting into the cells. Um, it has very strong local anticoagulant effects when you inhale it in the lungs without any spillover in the body. It has anti-inflammatory effects, which is important for this cytokine storm that's happening in the lungs, we believe, uh, and it has mucolytic effects. So far, what we've seen is that the safety profile is really good. Um, we have pre-COVID studies uh, and Barry Dixon study is the most important one. Uh, Pre-COVID studies that show that there is an effect on lung injury and that there is an effect on ARDS uh, and the case series again highlights that it's safe and that perhaps something is happening there in terms of oxygenation uh, of these patients with COVID-19. And with that, I thank you very much for listening and uh, thank you very much again for having me at the conference and um, I'll stop sharing my screen. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Van Haran, uh, for a very nice presentation about inhaled uh, nebulized heparin. So let's we move to the next session is question and answer. We can see that there is already a lot of uh, questions uh, to be answered, but we still have several questions that need to be addressed and answered. So first question is for uh, Professor John Marini, uh, there is a question about preserving spontaneous breathing in COVID IRDS, uh, such as uh, non-invasive ventilation or high flow nasal canal to reduce oxygen demand and PCLA. Uh, uh, what do you think? Uh, if you choose to intubate uh, the patients, so how do you approach it by muscle relaxant or deep sedations? Uh, what do you comment? This is a this is a very difficult, um, <laughs> a very difficult question for people to uh, to confront at the bedside. It is an integrated 
clinical decision as to what to use, what's tolerated, and what the progression has been. Uh, my short answer is that if the patient is not improving with um, modest treatment that uh, you, you have provided, uh, do not hesitate to intubate the patient because the, pro the problem, if it's, if it's persistent, it will be progressive over a long period of time. And um, there is no magic uh, answer as to, you know, what, what you use, what the, what the criterion is. Should it be a ROX index? Should it be a ventilatory ratio? Should it be whatever? Uh, I do pay special attention to the ventilation um, that, that the patient is uh, requiring uh, to, to maintain, uh, uh, you know, stable blood gases. Um, that, that's the short answer, uh, Dito. Thank you. So for the next question, <coughs> is, do you suggest more horizontal position when the P plateau is high? So is it control or assisted ventilations or will it increase the functional residual capacity or any other way? Well, um, <laughs> I try I try to make it clear that uh, this is a complete this is a study we're, we're completing right now. Uh, it surprised us to find that so many of our patients, in fact, all of them, uh, in going from horizontal to more upright, uh, deteriorated in terms of their compliance, their driving pressure, et cetera. Um, there's also hemodynamic effects to, to worry about as well. Some of these patients have been flat and sedated for long periods of time when you incline their, their head more than you know, 15 to 30 degrees, there, there tends to be some drop in, in uh, hemod hemodynamics. The point, uh, the point is that don't assume that a head up position is the best for you, especially if your, your plateau pressure is, let's say, 35 or 40. Try the patient more flat. Try with compressive effects on the belly, just a transient 10-second pressure on the, on, the, on the belly, and see if your plateau pressure doesn't come down. In a normal individual, you press on the abdomen, uh, you stiffen the chest wall, you contract the volume, you expect the compliance to, to, uh, to fall but actually it improves in many of these patients, probably for reasons Frank pointed out that many of these patients have extremely small baby lungs and in the later stages or in the severe stages. So uh, we, we're kind of excited about this because it can be done anywhere uh, and by virtually any physician. Um, so Dita, I will stop there. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Professor Barry Dixon or Van Haran, do you any comment about it? Look, I, I, I completely agree with John. I think um, uh, we didn't talk much about proning and the effect of proning, uh, self-proning and also proning once patients are intubated and ventilated. Um, and I, I certainly think that um, proning has an important role uh, for these, these COVID-19 ARDS patients, um, as, you, as you know from the meta trial, um, which, is, um, which is in itself sort of interesting, sort of the, the self-proning study was also done as a meta trial, just like, like the way we are doing our inhaled heparin study, basically combining individual studies from around the world so that you know, together you get more patients in quicker and you can answer the question. So the proning meta trial, the self-proning meta trial quite clearly shows, I think, benefit. Uh, and it's certainly what our practice has become. We really encourage our patients to self-prone as much as they can. And, and, the, and the, the improvements in oxygenation are just absolutely um, unbelievable sometimes um, when they self-prone and... Um, and similarly, once, I, once patients are intubated and ventilated, um, um, you know, uh, I think proning is an important part of it. And we, we prone our patients. Um, we have, you know, um, uh, a little bit of a, let's say, local algorithm. But when we, once we were at the peak, um, we had a proning team coming in uh, every day. In, in the morning to unprone all patients, you know, one by one. And then in the afternoon, they came back and proned them again. Um, and um, when you look at the PF ratio, so I showed in my, one of my slides, the SF ratio, the saturation 
so the pulse oximeter over FiO2. But if you do a blood gas and you measure the PaO2, you get the PF ratio. And when you plot it over time for these patients where you prone them on, on a daily basis, the PF ratio, you know, it, the, the response in, in almost all patients, I must say, is dramatic. You see these PF ratios that are low, you know, below 100, and then you prone them and they come up nicely and you unprone them and they drop again. And it, this is a pattern that you see over days. Um, and I guess, you know, one of the difficulties is making the decision to stop proning at some, at some point in time. And, you know, uh, what, 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 it, what should be the trigger to stop proning? Um, but um, anyway, I'll, I'm going off topic a little bit, but I just wanted to sort of highlight uh, something that we didn't discuss really in COVID-19 and pneumonitis and ARDS, and that's the role of proning, which I believe is is very important. Um, and um, you know, it's 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 really been implemented this time when we looked with lung save at how many people around the world prone their patients with ARDS. It was quite disappointing. It wasn't used very much, despite despite reasonably good evidence. But now, I think everyone in around the world is proning their patients with COVID nineteen because of the dramatic effects. Would you agree, John, that that's the role of proning? Almost right down the line, uh, Frank, it's, 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 uh, it's the, a better alternative than using higher PEEP to try to get an effective oxygenation. In the supine position, PEEP is unreliable. It may be dangerous. Um, proning, uh, and I don't know if it's the same in your, your uh, institution, but Proning is something we've been using since 1994 in, in, uh, in ARDS patients. It often works in, in COVID-19. It sometimes is disappointing. Uh, uh, you know, it, you, you expect a wonderful resp response and it, is not, it, it doesn't necessarily do that. It still makes sense from a lung protection point of view. It makes sense from for, to try. I, I mean, that's what critical care is, isn't it? We make a judgment, we try something and we observe the result. Um, and those simple interventions, and I loved, I'll, I'll divert just a second to, I love the, the two presentations you guys gave on inhaled heparin because it is something that's simple and doable. And whether or not it works, uh, is proven to work over, over time, I don't know, but I, I really love the concept and I've, and I really appreciate the fact that you guys are trying to implement something that anybody can do. Okay, thank you so much, <laughs> Professor Berry. Do you have any comment to to add about uh, it? Yeah, I agree with, with what uh, uh, everyone was saying, and I agree with Frank that the hard bit is when to stop because it's quite good when you see them improve their PF ratio, but obviously you need to keep them paralyzed and sedated and that has its own risks for the patient uh, in terms of other complications. And so, yeah, the hard part is actually choosing not to do it and choosing to wake them up and choosing to spontaneously ventilate them because um, things get, can get a little harder at that point. So I agree with Frank, yeah. You know, one of, can I say something here, uh, Dita? Yes, please. Um, one of the interesting things about proning in COVID-19 ARDS is that it may work by slightly different mechanisms. Than, uh, than conventional ARDS. Normally, compliance, recruitment, oxygenation, ventilation are all well coordinated with each other. If you recruit, then you get a better response. But in COVID-19, you may or may not recruit, and but you may shift the blood flows in such a way that uh, it makes an important difference. Instead of being over distended, in aerated air areas, proning tends to confine the lung a little bit, but prevent the over distension. And that may improve the, the, the blood flow to aerated lung units. This is something that, uh, that Luciano and I have been talking about uh, and, and uh, published a paper or two on. Uh, it's, it's, there's, there, there's not just one mechanism at work here. And COVID is significant, significantly different because of its vascular component. And, you know, proning may work with slightly different mechanisms. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, John. So we move to the next topic yeah, about nebulized heparin. So this is a lot of questions for Frank and Professor Barry Dixon's. Uh, 
So there is a question that about toxic dose of the heparin, do you have any literature or data about it? And should we combine heparin, nebulized or inhaled heparin with another uh, anticoagulant such as a low molecular uh, heparin, such as uh, anoxaparin or fondaparinox? Uh, uh, I'll answer the first, thank you. I'll answer the first question. So we, um, we we've put together uh, well my well, my co our co-workers in the UK have put together an investigators brochure for inhaled heparin with a lot of data. So there's a lot of data on inhaled heparin already from previous studies, mainly studies in COPD and cystic fibrosis and studies in healthy volunteers. So we know that 150,000 units inhaled. So that's a very high dose. Mm -hmm. That is sort of the dose where you start seeing some effects on the systemic uh, coagulation profile on some of the things that you can measure, your anti-10A and those sorts of things. So that's a super high dose. The dose that we're using, 25,000 units per inhalation, comes from various previous studies. And we know that that's, that that's a safe dose uh, as confirmed also in our case series. So it does, it does not affect significantly um, the coagulation profile in your in your body. So, and then we have other toxicity data as well for in that investigators brochure. And I'm happy to share that with people if they would like to have, have a look at that investigators brochure. And the second question, whether it can be combined with um, low molecular weight heparin or heparin. Uh, well, all patients are obviously usually on pro some prophylaxis, you know, clexane or infectionated heparin. Um, and both in Barry's study and in our case series, uh, we looked at that with a lot in a lot of detail. Um, maybe Barry, do you want to comment on, on your findings from, from Charlie in terms of the safety of combining these two? Yeah, so if you're on prophylactic um, low molecular weight uh, heparin, it, it, it doesn't really have any impact at all, it seems, on your APTT levels and PT levels. If you're on heparin, unfractionated heparin, it does increase your APTT a couple of seconds, which isn't really of any clinical consequence. Uh, if you're on systemic heparin, it does, you know, if you're on systemic anticoagulant heparin levels, it does sort of balance that up a bit more. Um, but then of course, you can just back off how much um, uh, systemic heparin you're getting. Okay, thank and, you. And if I can say in, in addition, so we had say, certainly in our case series, almost half the patients were on therapeutic anticoagulation. So they received high doses of clexane or high doses of infectionated heparin um, subcutaneously or IV as a treatment, as a treatment for PE or well, at least at those high levels. And in those patients, there was also no significant, you know, um, additional effect of the inhaled heparin on the numbers on the APTT and on any of the complications. Um, so, um, so yes, uh, we would, in our study, the patients, all the patients receive standard care, whatever the standard care is in the hospitals that these patients are. Uh, in most hospitals, standard care includes um, prophylaxis with, uh, with, with clexane or heparin, uh, DVT prophylaxis. Um, so that's normal. All these patients get that, and we give the inhaled heparin to half of the patients randomized, in addition to that standard care. Yeah. I'll just add something quickly, just because uh, I'm interested in it. But the, so when you look at groups, you don't see very big changes in the APTT, but you do at an individual level occasionally get a surprise with a high APTT in someone on nebulized heparin, and typically it's a smaller person who hasn't got a lot of acute lung injury. Obviously, when you've got a lot of acute lung injury, you're not gonna get much systemic uptake because all your microvascular beds are a bit wonky. Um, and the final thing I'll say, it, just, um, it also depends on the aerosol size of your nebulizer. Um, not, not all nebulizers are the same. Okay. So uh, let's say uh, if you're usually using uh, IV uh, heparin and we usually titrate it, uh, by the result of the APTT or D-dimer. Um, usually we monitor also by APTT and D-dimer for the IV heparins. Uh, 
So in nebulized heparin, there seems a, a very wide uh, range of doses from 15,000 to 100,000. Uh, how, how do you choose uh, the dosage? Uh, do you use a baseline D-dimer or, or platelet or APTT uh, when you choose the, the, the doses for nebulized heparin and how to monitor it? Do you I'll have? I take that one. Okay. Okay, Barry, yeah. please. So, yeah, there it is. Sorry. Um, so there's a couple of parts to that answer. One is that the the doses that are used um, are, are based on Barry's previous studies. Uh, but having said that, um, in our case series and also in our inhale hep studies, people are using different doses just because some of these studies were already, uh, the protocols were already um, finalized and approved before they came to, uh, to us to join the meta trial initiative. So we have, we have people, for example, in Argentina um, that give 5,000 units three times a day. And of course we, other studies give 25,000 units uh, every six hours. So there's a range of doses and there's also a range of devices. The, the mesh nebulizer that Barry showed uh, gives a lung dose of about 20%. So 20% of the fluid you nebulize actually enters deep into the lungs. When you use a jet nebulizer, that, that, that percentage drops to about 10%. So a jet nebulizer has a, a lower lung dose than a vibrating mesh nebulizer for the heparin and, and for other drugs as well, but also relevant to the heparin. So we will, in a metal trial, we will have several different individual studies that have different doses and also different devices. So we are going to look in that metal trial at the effects, whether there is an effect of the different doses and the different devices on some of the effects we see. So at the moment, we don't know and we dose uh, based on uh, Barry's previous work, which seems to be, um, it, you know, that 25,000 units seems to be an effective dose for the effects that he examined in the Charlie study. Um, and we think that that's a reasonable dose to give. Um, and also it's a safe dose to give based on, on the safety work before. But maybe a lower dose is fine. Maybe a higher dose is required. We don't know. We haven't done those finding studies in COVID-19 yet, but we'll get some of that data just from the meta trial because there are different studies with different doses in the meta trial. Can I add what, one thing here, uh, of, um, Frank and Barry? Uh, years and years ago, we did uh, studies with uh, inhaled bronchodilators, for example, and the size and the charges on, on the inhaled material were very important as to whether or not it got across the, 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 uh, uh, the alveolar membrane. Uh, we don't want that in, in the case of, of a bronchodilator. We really don't want that in terms of heparin, and, but heparin is a charged big molecule. So it, uh, apart from the excellent point that Barry made about the size of the baby lung being small. Um, and, you know, there's probably a lot of deposition that never reaches the alveoli, even if you're using a five micron particle, <laughs> but you can't get, get very small uh, and, and uncharged molecules with heparin. Um, there, there are a lot of intriguing questions, uh, not only questions, but opportunities. And I think it really, really it's a very intriguing topic. Yeah, okay. Professor Berry, do you have anything to comment? Oh, so I think I think it sort of covered the different um, a lot of the issues around what dose to use. Um, there was a study done also in Australia. I think they were using five thousand TDS, so five thousand three times a day to reduce acute lung injury symptomized study, and they didn't show a benefit. They were also using a range of different nebulizers. So I guess you can. See we, we, we chose 25,000 every six hours, not on the basis of efficacy, but on the basis of risk. So we were trying to avoid systemic changes to APTT. So as Frank said, you know, you could definitely potentially use a, a lower dose. We just don't know yet and, and show good efficacy. Um, that's work that some of Frank's um, studies will hopefully start to give us some um, ideas around. Okay. Okay, thank you.
So there is another questions about how long, uh, how many days do you give the nebulized heparin? Uh, do you usually give uh, seven days, uh, two weeks, or until uh, the PCR is negative? Or what if the patient's uh, going home with uh, the PCR still uh, positive? Do you continuously suggest to give the patients uh, nebulized heparin at home? Something like that. What, what do you think? I'll let Frank start. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's 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 different for the different studies. I mean, the answer is we don't know. But what we've chosen for most of the inhale HEP studies is that we stop giving heparin once the patient no longer requires oxygen. So when a patient has improved and he no longer requires oxygen, that's when we stop uh, and we give it a maximum of 21 days in that study. Um, but in the study of ventilated patients, so charter, the uh, Barry study, um, it's given up to 10 days. Is that correct, Barry? Yeah. So that's slightly different. Uh, it, we, will, we will definitely not give it uh, to patients when they go home, when they're discharged from the hospital. Um, but we are looking at, um, at also doing a study um, a bit like the study Barry showed with the nasal spray but then with a handheld nebulizer, when patients in the community get COVID, the idea is to then use the nebulizer uh, to keep them out of hospital, to basically treat, early treat, uh, rather than preventing, treat the COVID early on and, and then preventing them from having to come to hospital to get oxygen. Um, that's a study that we're not doing just yet. It's been in preparation, but we haven't, we haven't Come, we haven't gone far with getting funding or getting, um, you know, um, much much help with that study. But that's that's a very uh, attractive study as well because again, heparin is is cheap and available everywhere. So if 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 that works, um, especially in lower middle income countries, we could keep patients out of the hospitals, and especially in countries where vaccination rates are still very low, that would be quite an attractive way to um, to reduce some of the burden of COVID on these on these healthcare systems in these countries. Okay, thank you, Frank. Professor Bell, do you have any comments? To add? Um, so in terms of treatment, uh, generally, I, I don't know the answer is the simple answer. But in terms of treatment, just um, generally speaking, I have a tendency to stop things once I think the patient's on a trajectory, i.e. once I think they're sort of clearly over the crisis and they're clearly getting better each day and I generally stop most interventions at that point in terms of a treatment so you know I think it varies on the individual when you stop nebulized heparin um, in want to know more um, in terms of prophylaxis you know if you try as Frank's talking about trying to stop someone getting COVID um, I'll, 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 I will I will say that I've been <laughs> exposing myself to nasal heparin now for about a year and a half and <laughs> So far, no harm has been done. But I did get a nasty cold at once at one point, so maybe it's not totally protective. But um, I'm doing a, a, a trial of one. <laughs> Barry, can I can I ask you a question, or Frank, if you know the answer? Um, is heparin inactivated at a certain temperature above body temperature? In other words. Uh, <sighs> Years ago, not, not that many years ago, actually, uh, there was something called a viralizer that people uh, would, would uh, war take very warm, humidified saline or, or whatever uh, and prophylactically uh, or, or cut short uh, the, uh, the, 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 the you, you guys know what I'm talking about, uh, the um, the, the proliferation of, of an ordinary corona virus of a cold. Uh, and I don't know if it's, it's actually been tried uh, with, with COVID-19. Uh, you know, patients who are not intubated yet, uh, or even those intubated uh, using a higher than normal. Um, and, and the temperatures that were used with a viralizer or whatever were not that high. Uh, you know, they weren't enough to, to cause tissue injury or anything, anything like that. Uh, it seems like there's some interface here that, that might be explorable and interesting. Well, um, John, as, you, as, you, as, you, as I'm sure you're aware, there's data on the, on the 
um, on SARS-CoV-2 and temperature, uh, mainly in sort of um, how long it can stay viable on surfaces. And when the temperature in the environment is, is, is cranked up to higher temperatures, the, the duration that the virus is still viable on surfaces goes down significantly. So the virus is definitely sensitive to temperature. Uh, so when you, when you crank up a room to 30 degrees or 40 degrees, it significantly reduces the duration of, uh, of, of viable virus particles, um, both in the air, but also on all, on all the surfaces. That's been shown in a couple of very nice studies. So there is a temperature um, sensitivity. Um, and of course, um, but your question was also about whether heparin would be inactivated by other temperatures. I, I pass it on to Barry. I, I don't know the specific answer. I just know generally heparin is a very stable molecule and pretty robust. Um, my, my, my suspicion is it, it would be stable, you know, even in high temperature environments, but that's just a suspicion I have. Well, perhaps there's a, there's a synergy that could be explored. You guys are the guys to do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, we're, we're also um, um, part of a platform trial where they're measuring viral clearance. So basically viral load by uh, uh, cycle time PCR, um, but inhaling heparin, whether that reduces that viral load um, quicker than by giving placebo. That's also something that hopefully will have in the not too distant future data on, on the actual viral load and viral clearance. Okay, so since the Omicron variant is rising, especially also in Indonesia, and we have a lot of self-isolated patients at home, so maybe we can wait the result from Professor Barry and Professor Van Harn for nasal drop heparin at home, yeah. So maybe we can also try to join the trial in Indonesia. I think it's very, very useful, especially for patients who's at home with their family. Uh, so I think it, we would come to the end of the session, yeah, Dr. Krisha, yeah. Okay, so as a wrap in this, this uh, session, uh, thank you a lot for, for Professor Marini, uh, Barry Dixon and Professor Van Haran. So as a take home message, uh, COVID RDS at all stages, uh, we should limit the tidal transpulmonary pressure and mechanical power. We interfere uh, early to interrupt forceful inspiratory efforts and excessive uh, flow in the lung. And we should reduce oxygen demand to limit the PCLA patient self inflicted injury induced ventilations and excessive mechanical uh, ventilations. And for nebulized heparin, it may have antiviral effect and improve bronchoalveolar hemostasis, including helps fibrin depositions in the alveolar and its vascular uh, problems. And we still wait for the result of the multicenter clinical study, uh, still working on to confirm its benefits. Hopefully Indonesia, uh, we'll join uh, the study soon, yeah, as soon as we get uh, the ethical approval from our hospital. So thank you so much for John, uh, Barry, and Frank. So thank you for all the participants, all the speakers for today's session. Thank you so much. Uh, stay healthy. See thank you. Bye-bye. Thank yeah. you, Dr. Dita.